Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I um, have a couple of really interesting things to talk about today and I'll start with this one. Apparently John McDougall is absolutely right. Humans have always lived on a starch-based diet. Uh, so this, this uh, article I'm going to talk about, this research study, is going to make the uh, plant-based people happy and the paleo people a little upset, which I don't really care about that I suppose. Uh, the research team reported in a quarterly review of biology that carbohydrate intake, especially starch, was needed for the expansion of the human brain. In other words, what they're saying is the paleo diet was starch-based, not animal foods-based. Well, the group based its conclusions on archaeological, anthropological, genetic, physiological, and anatomical data. And so I'll give you some examples. One example is that the human brain uses up to 60% of the glucose that circulates in the bloodstream. The body can synthesize glucose from other sources, but the preferred energy source and the one that is most efficient is glucose, which uh, is a source of fuel, and that comes from carbohydrate. The group states that based on what we know about brain function, it is highly unlikely that the large demands for glucose could have been met on a low-carbohydrate diet. So our brains got bigger and our thinking capacity expanded because we were eating. Yes, Dr. John McDougall, you were right, starch. Pregnancy and lactation increase glucose needs. And let's think about it, if the species cannot perpetuate itself through reproduction, we're in real trouble. We wouldn't have been able to survive to have this interchange on, on YouTube here. Uh, low maternal blood glucose levels can compromise and even threaten the lives of both the mother and the fetus. So it's unlikely that we could have survived while eating a diet based in animal foods because there's no carbohydrate or glucose to be readily had from, no carbohydrate and no ready glucose uh, to be had from animal foods. Now, another thing that is interesting is humans have several genes for salivary amylase, while animals that eat a diet that's centered on animal foods have very few of those genes. The genes cause the production of amylase, which gives us the ability to digest starch. Starchy foods were readily available to early man in the form of tubers, and then there were ample supplies of things like fruit and nuts. Now, raw starches are not very easy to digest, while cooked starches are quite easy to digest. And so the researchers write, cooked starch, a source of preformed glucose, greatly increased energy availability to human tissues with high glucose demands, such as the brain, red blood cells, and the developing fetus. And so the researchers said a combination of the development of cooking as a food preparation practice and the increasing numbers of genes that code for salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase, actually, increase the availability of preformed dietary glucose for the brain, including the fetal brain. And this led to accelerated growth of the brain. So um, I, I could go on. There's lots more to the article, but the bottom line is I think it's time to redefine the paleo diet. It's been used by a group of people who advocate an animal foods-based diet for a long time. Uh, but there's not very much evidence to support the idea that this was the diet eaten by our ancestors. Um, in an advanced study class a long time ago, I um, uh, covered a book, great book, called Powered by Plants by Don Matez, where I think he has 900, 700 or 900 references in this book, and he talks about the improbability of the paleo diet having been animal-based. So the evidence just doesn't go to paleo, have it, paleo diet of our ancestors having been animal foods-based. I frankly think that one of the reasons reasons why they use paleo to describe the diet is that it used to be called the Atkins diet and that's been discredited in so many circles they had to think of a new name for it. But um, uh, I think humans actually always have eaten a plant-based diet and are well adapted to eating a plant-based diet and I'm looking forward to the day when the paleo people just can't get away with telling people false information anymore. So we'll keep putting this stuff out there until one fine day everybody will know. All right. So now I want to talk about sugar and depression. I get a lot of um, email uh, inquiries about do I think diet causes depression and what is the relationship and, and boy, it is a, uh, it's a complicated issue. Um, on the one hand, um, depression and other psychological issues, I don't like to call um, I don't like to call this mental illness and emotional illness. I don't even like those terms, so I call them psychological issues. It's a result of distorted thinking. And I think food is pow pretty powerful stuff, but I just really can't wrap my head around how apples could make somebody feel unlovable or um, the, you know, have somebody develop distorted thinking patterns like um, I'll never amount to anything and you know, that sort of thing. I just don't think food does that. On the other hand, um, the issue, there is an issue that has 
developed in the last several years where depression has become a really broad term that now includes things like feelings of fatigue and low energy and general unhappiness and boy diet can have a profound effect on fatigue and energy levels and people who are chronically tired and have low energy can sometimes feel pretty depressed about not being able to do stuff you know and be unhappy so I, I think we have broadened the definition of depression and definitely diet may play a role there and then you have an issue with people who are depressed or on their way to becoming depressed um, often don't take really good care of themselves and they can even use food to make them happy. I mean, chocolate and pastry can be almost as good as drugs for improving mood sometimes. I mean, you know, I don't think I'm depressed, but I have to say chocolate improves my mood. I totally get that. So some new data supports the idea that, that diet is a factor in the development of depression and I don't know that we see a cause and effect relationship, but I think that we certainly should include diet in the, in the discussion of how we address depression. Um, I, I think anytime we start focusing on one thing, it's just a form of reductionism. Let's just face it, we're all kind of messy humans and it takes more than one thing to fix us when we have problems. So anyway, in, in the study that I'm going to refer to, researchers looked at, a, they performed a cross-sectional analysis of over 93,000 postmenopausal women between the ages of 50 and 74 to determine if food choices were linked to the onset of depression. So they excluded women at baseline who had depression. What they wanted to see is how do these women eat? And is there a connection to dietary pattern in the women who do develop depression? They found that women who ate more refined grains and added sugars were more likely to become depressed, full-blown depression, than women who ate a lot of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and fiber. Now they were clear that the effect was not the sugar in the fruit or the carbohydrate, it was added sugars, it was the junk food that they were talking about. Um, they said that there was no uh, connection between glycemic load and depression. And I, this glycemic index thing, it's an interesting academic exercise. I really don't think that it has much bearing on how to choose food, so I was sort of glad to see that. Now the researchers said that there were limitations in their study, one of which was that all the diet information was self-reported. Now I, I believe that's a limitation, but actually research shows that when people report on their own eating habits, they tend to over-exaggerate the good foods they eat and under-report the bad foods they eat. And if that were to hold true for this study, it means that um, uh, these women were uh, actually experiencing improvements in health, you know, whatever fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes they were reporting. They were probably eating less, which means that the positive effect was, was noted at even a lower amount of plant food intake. Um, the other limitation acknowledged by the authors was that depression was self-reported rather than diagnosed via psychiatric evaluation. Now from a pure research standpoint, I'm sure that that's true, but in my experience, people who say they're depressed usually are depressed. And um, psychiatric evaluation is at best an imprecise science, so again, from a pure research standpoint, I'm sure that I would agree, but, but um, from a practical standpoint, I don't think it really makes any difference. So the take-home point is that dietary change can not only make somebody better from a physical standpoint, can help to resolve degenerative conditions um, that are physical, but uh, can also play a role in helping somebody to make, um, uh, to make them feel better from a mental and emotional standpoint too. Food really is powerful stuff, but I don't think we're gonna jump off the cliff and say eating toaster pastries is gonna cause you to be depressed. I think that um, eating toaster pastries might be a symptom of depression and getting better means feeling better mentally and physically, and so get the toaster pastries out of the diet. Good idea for a whole lot of reasons. All right, that's all for today. As usual, I'll pass this on to anybody else who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next Tuesday with more news.